This is a graph tracing the journey of the word avatar across the pages of English literature from the 1800s to today. Notice in the late 1990s, the word exploded in popularity. By then, avatar had already become part of gaming and internet culture, referring to a user's character in a game or their image on screen in one of those Web 1.0 forums. Then in 2005, Nickelodeon published the hit animated series Avatar, The Last Airbender, in which the avatar spirit is an entity that reincarnates within different humans throughout history, each one becoming the avatar, an individual who maintains the world's balance and harmony. Then in 2009, James Cameron's movie Avatar was released, quickly becoming the highest grossing movie of all time. In the movie, an avatar is a biologically engineered body that humans control remotely. These are all kind of conceptually related. An avatar refers to a person or entity being represented or embodied in a different form. Me as a little cartoon figure, Sergeant Forgettable Name in a blue alien body, or the avatar spirit inhabiting Aang. But while avatar has only recently become a mainstream word in English, the concept is much, much older, deriving from Hindu scriptures thousands of years old. And while these pop culture avatars share some of the elements that we see in Hinduism, there are some key differences. The word avatar comes from the Sanskrit word avatara, which means to descend or cross downward. Within Hinduism, it refers to a divine descent, when a deity manifests in a new form on earth in order to restore order, defeat evil, and protect the virtuous. As a quick example, Rama, the hero of the epic called the Ramayana, is understood to be an avatar of the god Vishnu in several Hindu versions of the Ramayana. In this story, Rama is the crown prince of the city of Ayodhya and defeats the main antagonist of the story, the multi-headed king Ravana. Now, avatara is often translated as incarnation, though this sometimes leads to surface-level comparisons with Jesus and the doctrine of incarnation according to Christianity. But the two concepts are very different. The literal translation of descent works just as well, if not better, because the deities are understood as descending from their divine abodes to the material realm. The word avatara is actually closely tied to Sanskrit vocabulary regarding theatrical performances. The word avatarana is a technical Sanskrit term describing the movement of actors from the stage wings onto the stage itself. So one way we can think about an avatara is a god like Vishnu as he takes his place on the world stage. The term itself appears somewhat late in Hindu scriptures, well into the common era, but the concept of different divine manifestations stretches back much earlier. For example, earlier texts like the Harivamsha use the term pratrabhavas, or manifestations, and some have even traced the idea to the Vedas, the oldest scriptures in Hinduism. A hymn to Vishnu in the Rig Veda references Vishnu taking on a different form in battle. But the classic formulation of the concept is found in the Bhagavad Gita, which is part of the Sanskrit epic the Mahabharata. The Bhagavad Gita is a dialogue between the god Krishna, who's also considered by many to be an avatar of Vishnu, and the warrior Arjuna, as they discuss things like karma, dharma, and the nature of the self. At one point, Krishna says, despite being unborn and essentially imperishable, despite being the lord of all beings, I resort to my phenomenal nature and come into being through my creative power. I send myself forth whenever dharma declines and adharma is on the rise. Age after age, I come into being to protect the virtuous, destroy the wicked, and reestablish dharma. The word avatara actually does not appear in this passage, or anywhere in the Bhagavad Gita for that matter, but it's generally viewed that he's referring to the concept. When he says he comes into being through my creative power, Krishna is explaining that he can spontaneously manifest in the physical world by his own divine will, and he does this with a purpose, in order to restore dharma, or social and cosmic order, that would otherwise collapse without his intervention. Generally, this means defeating some sort of antagonist that has thrown the world into chaos, like the King Ravana and the Ramayana. Notice that Krishna explicitly says that he's unborn and imperishable. The implication here is that he is beyond the cycle of samsara, the cycle of birth and death. This means that these manifestations are not like other beings who are stuck in samsara. These ordinary beings reincarnate in a different form as a result of their past karma, but an avatara of Vishnu is a new form resulting from his creative power, not understood to be an illusion, but a real body. Now, I've mentioned Vishnu a few times already because the concept of an avatara or divine descent is most prominent within the branch of Hinduism called Vaishnavism. Vaishnavism is an incredibly diverse constellation of communities and traditions, but generally speaking, Vaishnavas are Hindus who recognize and worship Vishnu, or some form of Vishnu like Krishna, as the supreme god. 
Avatars play a prominent role within these traditions because Vishnu is understood to have descended in a series of manifestations throughout the eons. Now, the exact number of these avatars differ depending on the text. Earlier texts like the Mahabharata list 4, 6, or 8 avatars of Vishnu. The Pancharatra Samhitas mention 29, and the text called the Bhagavata Purana gives a list of 22, but then elsewhere says there are countless avatars of Vishnu, just as thousands of rivulets flow from a lake that never dries. But over the centuries, a list of 10 primary avatars called the Dush Avatara become a widespread standard, listed here on screen. The two most famous are the previously mentioned Rama and Krishna. Rama, as we said, is the hero of the Ramayana. Krishna, an important figure in the Mahabharata and the god of the Bhagavad Gita. Other avatars from the Dush Avatara include a few animals and an animal-human hybrid, including Matsya the fish, Kurma the tortoise, Varaha the boar, and Narasimha the man-lion. As with Rama and Krishna, these are divine descents with a purpose, to restore dharma in a world gone astray. For example, the Bhagavata Purana includes a dramatic story of Vishnu descending as a fish to rescue the Vedas, which were stolen from the creator Brahma by a demon. Looking at the ten manifestations of the Dush Avatara, some Hindus noticed what appeared to be an evolutionary progression, and in the 1800s they developed a belief that scholars call avataric evolutionism the belief that the ten avatars of Vishnu parallel and foreshadow the modern theory of Darwinian evolution. You have a fish, then you have a turtle, a creature that lives some of its life in the water and some on the land, then you have a land animal, and then Narasimha, a literal half-human, half-animal being. So as Darwinian evolution started to be taught in India in the late 1800s, some read this progression from fish to man-lion to Rama through the lens of modern science. Now, looking through these ten avatars, one might stand out to you as somewhat unexpected. The Buddha himself. Now, the Buddha is not included in all lists of Vishnu's avatars, and he seems to be a late addition, added around 550 CE, if not later. But his status as an avatara is widespread, and is mentioned in several different texts. But why would Vishnu descend as the Buddha? Someone who denied the existence of Brahman, the Hindu concept of the supreme reality, the source of all knowing and being. Someone who denied the divine origins of the Vedas. Well, there is some controversy, and Hindus throughout history have offered different theories. Some texts, like the Bhagavata Purana, argue that Vishnu descended as the Buddha to purposely spread false knowledge in order to destabilize the wicked. The text says, Then in the beginning of Kali Yuga, which is the age we're currently living in, the Lord will appear as Lord Buddha in the province of Gaia just for the purpose of deluding those who are envious of the faithful theist. Other traditions say that he descended as the Buddha to teach compassion, the rights of animals, and nonviolence. In his poem called the Gita Govinda, the Hindu poet Jayadeva writes, Moved by deep compassion, you condemn the Vedic way that ordains animal slaughter in rites of sacrifice. You take form as the enlightened Buddha. In other words, Vishnu descended as the Buddha in order to promote nonviolence. Others argue that Vishnu descended as a different Buddha. Now, when we say the Buddha, we're generally referring to Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha that Buddhists recognize as the enlightened one of this current age, aka Shakyamuni Buddha. But most Buddhists recognize that there were other Buddhas before Shakyamuni Buddha, and some Hindus argue that Vishnu descended as one of them instead, a different earlier Buddha named Sugata Buddha. And still others reject the idea entirely. The Buddha was not an avatar of Vishnu in the first place, and instead they view Krishna's brother Balarama as the eighth and Krishna as the ninth in the Dush Avatara. The final avatara is Kalki, an avatar yet to come, who will descend at the end of this current age, Kali Yuga. The Vishnu Purana describes Kalki as endowed with greatness and irresistible power. He will re-establish this whole world in virtue. As the concept of an avatar developed within Hinduism, some philosophers started to distinguish between full avatars and partial avatars, or amshavataras. From this perspective, Krishna and sometimes Rama and Narasimha are considered full avatars and the rest as partial or secondary manifestations. Though some academics prefer a more precise translation than partial avatar, such as a divine descent of a portion of divine substance, with the understanding that the gods only need a fragment of their unlimited divine substance to appear in the human world. And though avatars are most closely associated with Vishnu, other gods are understood to have descended as avatars as well. For example, Gaudiya Vaishnavism is a tradition that recognizes Krishna as the source of all avatars rather than Vishnu. Mahadevi, the great goddess, is said to have descended in a series of avatars as well. In fact, the text Devi Mahatmya describes a whole series of avatars, which may consciously parallel Vishnu's Dash avatara. Throughout the history of Hinduism, some leaders and founders of various movements even came to be viewed as avatars themselves by their followers. 
For example, back in the 1500s, the Bengali saint Chaitanya was considered by his followers to be an avatara of Krishna, a dual avatara of Krishna and the goddess Radha, or a partial avatara of Vishnu, depending on the biographer. And even within the last few decades, spiritual leaders like Satya Sai Baba are viewed as avatars by their followers as well, though never without controversy. As is the case with sectarian movements around the world, these claims are generally not recognized outside of their community of followers. The concept of avatars even appears in other South Asian religious traditions, and sometimes in surprising ways. For example, let's consider the opening passages of an epic work by the Bengali Muslim writer Syed Sultan. Having taken the form of Muhammad, his own avatara, Naranjana manifests his own portion to propagate himself. From time's beginning to its end, the creator shall create messengers to rightly guide all peoples. Here, Sultan refers to Muhammad as a partial avatar of God, and refers to God using the term Naranjana, which Vaishnava texts often use to refer to Vishnu. The scholar Aisha Irani argues that this is not an example of Hinduism and Islam melding, but rather this is Sultan's conscious effort to convert the people of Bengal to Islam. She says by referring to the Supreme God in local terms, and by employing vocabulary drawn from Vaishnavism, Sultan was subtly presenting Islamic doctrine as something that was right at home within the broader landscape of Bengali religious traditions. So let's return to that avatar surge in the 1990s. We owe a lot of that to this guy, the video game developer and entrepreneur Richard Garriott who's credited for using the term avatar to refer to a gamer's on-screen representation. Back in 1985, he was working on the game Ultima 4, an open-world role-playing game. Unlike other RPGs at the time, Ultima 4 incorporated a deep moral system, in which a player's decisions and actions directly affected their ethical standing in the game. NPCs would treat you differently based on your virtue, whether or not you were acting like a jerk. And because players are always making ethical decisions in the game, Garriott wanted the players to empathize with the character on screen view the character to be actually you and not some alter ego. And while doing research on ethics for the game, he came across the concept of avatars in Hindu scriptures. And he viewed it as a good analogy. Just like how Vishnu descends down to Earth, a player manifests in a new world. The game's developer origin systems even trademarked the word avatar for a few years before finally releasing it to the public. And it's not a perfect analogy. A gaming avatar is virtual, while an avatar in Hinduism is physical. Avatar in the context of gaming also loses that salvific aspect, insofar as deities descend as avatars specifically to restore and uphold dharma that had languished. Nevertheless, the concept of avatars in modern pop culture is a great example of how religious and cultural ideas are adapted and integrated into new and different contexts, sometimes losing nuance and sometimes gaining new meanings, like a digital presence. But our digital presence online goes way beyond a profile picture on a website. We all leave a huge digital footprint online, a wealth of personal information scattered across the internet, which you can get taken down with the help of today's sponsor, Incogni. A lot of our personal information ends up in the hands of data brokers. These are companies that collect and sell your personal information to third parties, often without your informed consent. This includes your full name, but also your home address, phone number, and even your employment history, medical history, shopping habits, or political affiliation. On the annoying end of the spectrum, this can lead to spam calls, and on the very serious end of the spectrum, it could lead to identity theft. You actually have a right to request these brokers to remove your data, but that would take literally hundreds of hours of your time to research and contact all of them. And here's where Incogni comes in. Incogni reaches out to data brokers on your behalf, requests your personal data to be removed, and deals with any objections from the brokers. All you need to do is create an account, grant them the right to work on your behalf, and sit back and get periodic updates. I've been using Incogni since 2022, and it's pretty cool to see the results over a long span of time. They've removed my data from 158 companies, and I've actually been added to 39 suppression lists, which means 39 brokers have decided never to recollect my personal information. Which is great, because these brokers will often just continuously re-add your information even if you requested it to be removed. So if you'd like to give Incogni a try, click the link below and use the code RFBINCOGNI to get an exclusive 60% off an annual plan. Again, click the link pinned in the comments below and the code is RFBINCOGNI. Thanks everyone.